the way you do it is just a little bit of chaos. Like the best results I find in a company happen, at least for me, and I've heard other entrepreneurs say it too, is the best results don't happen when everything is perfectly ordered. And they certainly don't happen with pure chaos. They happen right at the edge of chaos. Like just ordered enough that things are working, but just chaotic enough that people are able to express themselves freely and go a little bit outside the system to achieve their goals. Well, and that's I where see artists live. Yes, artists live yes, there yes. on the edge of chaos. Yes. yes. And that's been my personal experience, right? And that's a government thing too. Like I see, you know, do I want to live in a system like China with a social credit store, score that counts how many beans I ate that month? Uh, you know, or do I like that in the West, you know, we have a certain amount of respect for our institutions that things work, but just enough chaos for us to still be able to disrupt. Obviously, you don't want it to be so desperate that people are trying to survive. Uh, but sometimes a little bit of that's okay. Like a lot of the most successful people I know yeah. certainly come from pretty disruptive backgrounds. Welcome back to another episode of Behind Greatness by Inspire. Luciano here speaking as usual. Thank you for coming back. Uh, for the new listener, thank you for joining us. Um, as our veteran listeners know, we're a non-for-profit. We've been around 14 years, 13, 13 years. I don't want to skip ahead. Uh, 13 years podcast, four years. Uh, we have a great and very profound uh, content library. Uh, have a check when you get a chance, when you're there, and if you're so inclined, uh, because we're not for profit and a charity, you can uh, also find where you can donate if you're so inclined, as I mentioned. But have a listen anyway to all of the episodes. So uh, get going. So today we have another guest. He's joining us. Uh, he's a Canadian entrepreneur living in Estonia. His name is Dimitri Tukshir. He is the founder and CEO of LGFG Fashion House, a global bespoke tailoring company that operates in over 20 countries. He was born in the Ukraine. He immigrated to Canada at the age of nine. He financed his own education by selling books door to door. Yes, people used to do that. Uh, eventually generating over $1 million annually, allowing him to graduate debt-free from the University of British Columbia Sauter School of Business with a degree in commerce and financing LGFG Fashion House. He started the company from his apartment. He and his wife cold called, cold called. We're going to talk about that too, because I think that the, that is uh, becoming a lost art. So he, he and his wife cold called businesses and sold suits, achieving 1 million revenue in their first year. LGFG has since grown significantly, catering to a high-end clientele, including celebrities like Dr. Jordan Peterson, Ozzy Osbourne, Alice Cooper, Eddie Hall, Ronnie Coleman, and featured in Hollywood films such as Skyscraper, starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Dimitri, welcome hey. to the program. Thanks for having me. I got your last name right, didn't I? I got a nod of approval, I think, there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am, uh, I think we can end the podcast right now. I think that's it. Like I'm, I'm in, par I'm in paradise. Those of us with I... weird last names know the implications of just somebody getting it right one time. It's like, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. It's you, you feel relief when people do that. Yeah. 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 Crazy, I, it's, right? it, it, so my, my first name it's pronounced Luciano, obviously is because yeah. uh, it's Italian, but uh, living in Canada in an, in the Anglosphere, it was always pronounced Luciano. So I used to get I used to get teased with Lucy, Lucy, Lucy all yeah, the time yeah. when I was small. And I remember there was a, a there was a point of cultural insensitivity once. I was like, I was in my early 20s. This is in a hospital waiting room just for a checkup. And um, it was a nurse. She called me. She said, Luciano, I came to her. I said, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is pronounced. This is the way I said it, too. It's probably the way I said it. I said, my name is really pronounced Luciano. And she looks down at the paper and says, that's not the way it's written. <laughs> I said, you know, from, from now on, I'm not going to correct anybody. I can't care. I can't care. But to your point, it it is freeing when somebody does get it. Well, and but in good news, living in Canada, you can just be Lucy now, like, and and people will call you Lucy. They'll call you whatever you want. Like, hey, I guess yeah. I guess we win, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Because you stop caring. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that. It's just people are so afraid to offend you now. You can literally say my name's Lucy. Oh, and by the way, I'm joining the girls team. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to start. Okay, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna hit some of those points too. I, I think it'll why, be fun. Why not? I think it'll be fun. Okay, so we can we can go down uh, a few roads here. I, I want to go down the the road of the matrix first, uh, and the reason why is because we had we had a guest on maybe last year, year and a half ago. His name is Jack Bartsky. And he was uh, a former spy for the KGB. So he talked about uh, living in a matrix in the USSR. Uh, and so you, when you and I chatted last time, 
That's what you said. So you mm-hmm. you emigrated to Canada when you were nine. I was nine. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then you said something uh, almost in the same breath. Uh, you said what you found perplexing is that teachers in Canada, in your experience, turned a blind eye to bullying. Mm. So that that got me to understand that you were a, uh, you, you were you were drawing a thread to both. Is that a different kind of matrix that you moved into, or am I am I reading well, too so, much? Well, so so I get I guess the the ethos of that statement was that um, for those of us that had the experience of growing up on basically another planet, so like the way the world is set up today, and I travel extensively, and I remember I, I might have shared this with you before, like back in about 2015, uh, we started selling suits in Moscow in the in Russia, and we were also kind of starting to sell some suits in Germany. Like we were kind of going there and meeting a few clients, you know, kind of getting business off the ground. And I was in Frankfurt one day, I was in Moscow the next day, and I woke up and I was uh, on a train and it took me a second to realize I wasn't in Frankfurt anymore because cities are becoming quite homogenous across the world. Like things become kind of the same as globalization becomes a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But back in like, you know, the 80s and 90s, the Soviet Union was just a completely different planet. Okay, Um, just things were different. It was it was like it was like the the cultural, not not only cultural, but the economic things were different. And as we get into the podcast more, you know, we talk about the career I chose, which was sales. There was no salespeople in the Soviet Union. Like when I told my mom, you know, in Canada at university, like, hey, I want to pursue selling as a career which eventually, you know, culminated into entrepreneurship, as it often does, my mom was like, what sales? Because everything was owned by the state. So you didn't have salespeople selling things, right? Like you need yeah. to buy a hat, you go to the guy that makes the hat that's mandated by the state at the atelier, which is the shop that sells the hats. And his salary is set by the state and how many hats he can produce per month is set by the state. So everything is just controlled, right? Um, the way that the way that sort of grows from the school level is every morning you go to school, uh, you have to recite a poem out loud in the class, uh, proclaiming that you love the government and that you love Lenin. That's something you say out loud. Uh, I think the the exact translation was that the state, the the government is my father and the Soviet is my mother, something like that, like loosely translated. So you have a very narrow view of the world, but part of that narrowness is, which is implicit in narrowness, and I think you see it in highly authoritarian states today as well is that you just believe you're in the best place on earth and anybody that questions that is literally insane, right? So they just, because they they lie to you all the time. It's like, we have the best scientists, we have the most food, we have the greatest technology. And I really believe that. Like, I was very proud to be in the Soviet Union because I was, as a child, singing songs and reciting poetry. Sure. um, To, you know, to, that. well, I mean, look, it's it's just like, it's not a coercive. It's like an impelling principle of, of persuasion, right? You look at Cialdini's Influence, a great book about that. It's like, that's how they brainwashed Korean POWs, right? Is they they made you write essays about why communism was the best, and then the best essay got food, and eventually whatever you write and say, you start to believe. And so brainwashing a child is not that hard. But then you know we immigrate to Canada in '92, and and I and I have a major shock. Like the stores have more food than I've ever seen in my life. I didn't even know that abundance of food was a thing. I'm like, there's way more food. Because in the USSR, mm. you had to line up, you know, your grandmother would go for bread at 4.30 in the morning and wait till 6 in the morning in line because by 8 a.m. the bread was sold out. And that's just how it was. Um, and I started noticing technology was better. And I think that's a really good formation as an entrepreneur, like at a, at a young age to realize that like everything about your life and around you has just been a complete and utter lie. You know, and it was and everybody that comes from Cuba, you know, from North Korea, you see some escapees from the Soviet Union. We all have a pretty low trust for government because we've all seen what it's like to live in a society where everybody lies to each other all the time. And I'm not really sure people realize they're lying all the time, but they are. So I want to talk about food and desperation. Um, But before that, you also, uh, that memory triggered a a conversation I had with Luis Zuniga on the podcast as well. And he's he's a fellow, he's now in his 70s, mid 70s. But in his early 20s, growing up in Cuba, he saw that matrix. He saw it. He saw it happening. So uh, he he was a youngster before the revolution, and the revolution happened. He wasn't allowed. Um, he wasn't allowed to graduate from university unless he declared that he was a communist, and he refused to do that. So he spent like close to twenty years in jail, yeah, including half of that in solitary confinement. Uh, but he he knew he knew what it was before it became. So he had an understanding. Uh, you didn't. You were born into it. I'm going to assume that uh, if your parents didn't emigrate, uh, it would have been much harder for you to break out of that. 
Well, the state, collapsed. the state collapsed. So there's, you know, there's also an, a lot of resentment came from that because after the state collapsed, I think a lot of people realized, and a lot of people did already know, they, they just didn't say it because you would disappear for saying the wrong thing, right? I think this is one of the interesting things about, and, and kind of how it led me to perceive the world in terms of authority. Like, even as a child, like when something like that happens, uh, you know, like you have a, a monumental paradigm shift in what was being told to you to what you observe. And I remember very clearly, like, in the Soviet Union, we were told, you know, that the Soviets, the Russians and the Soviets won World War II, the Great War. Like, that was a really big topic. Even in, in the second grade, we were taken to, like, World War II Memorial Museums to learn. And this was all about a little bit of, you know, brainwashing and into, like, some good old nationalism to probably prepare you for the next war, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then I came to Canada and I remember learning in grade six, like it was the Canadian snipers, you know, that, that, that went to Normandy and, and, and saved the Belgians. And that's why the Belgians love Canadians, how the Canadians won the war. And then mm-hmm. I, I had a lot of American friends, uh, that sort of were, you know, emigrated from the States or their parents were working on contracts in Canada. And they were talking about how the Americans won the war. And I'm like, wow, every nation takes such profound credit for winning the war, um, <laughs> And, and again, it just kind of made me realize that, like, you can't always trust authority, which probably planted some entrepreneurial seeds, you know? Sure, sure. Um, and, and that culminated into some really weird outcomes during the COVID pandemic. I don't know if I can say that word on podcast now or not, because, you know, when when I think it became abundantly clear that the vaccine that was introduced not only uh, did not necessarily, let's say, prevent uh death and sickness or or if it did it certainly didn't do to the extent that was advertised but then also didn't prevent this didn't prevent the spread of the virus itself and then i understood that the reason we're being pushed uh you know uh let's say we were being pushed uh boosters was not so much for scientific reasons but basically as a way to proclaim your allegiance to the state because re- getting that booster will allow you to just live as a free citizen once again or so they said and i'm like that's interesting so doing that thing Taking that thing and having that stamp is what not really, and especially let's say as a younger male that was not really in a demographic, like overtly affected by whatever was going around, it was more so like, oh, and even though let's say I chose to be vaccinated, it was my personal choice, by forcing it on other people, you're basically just forcing them to take an ideological stance in alignment with your government. Otherwise, they take away your rights. And my mom and my dad both independently told me, like, this feels a lot like communism. Ah, right. Well, so, but that's the thing is your, your mom and your dad have that perspective. So people yeah. growing up, so as an example, let's just take Canada, well, let's just take the US, uh, whatever, any Western country, not having that backdrop, not having elders in our community who have lived that experience, we don't know it when it arrives. So my grandfather, he's quite old hmm. um, and he's always been a fairly agnostic sort of uh, agnostic person like just you know very non-religious never saw anything like that but in the final few years now let's say still alive but he, you know he's he's in the night in his 90s and so as he's getting to his older years he's living in a in a in an old folks home and he started going to synagogue like but not like just any old synagogue he started going to like a fairly conservative synagogue like i've just i was just like shocked right and and so i i said grandpa like you know, it's it's kind of strange to me that like you're you're having this you know profundity towards religion right now. I've never really seen anything like that in our family. Were you particularly Jewish growing up? You know, and mm-hmm. his answer sent me into into a quagmire. He goes, "Yeah, I was as Jewish as the stamp in my passport." <laughs> that was his answer. So here's what's really interesting. Like I started to unpack what that meant. This was actually during the pandemic that this started happening. So I I was like. Jewish is the stamp in your passport. Like, what the hell does that mean? And then, and then as I dug deeper, I understood that the stamp, my, my, you know, my, the stamp in my passport, my grandfather's an engineer. He's a very intelligent guy. Basically, it said, like, here's your ethnicity. And it said Jew. That was the ethnicity in the passport in the Soviet Union. You had to have it. And mm-hmm. that ethnicity stamp in his passport, despite the fact that he had absolutely no religious inclinations whatsoever, like, was about as, uh, as agnostic and, uh, you know, like, just, atheistic person i've ever known just you know engineer mathematical very smart guy the stamp in his passport prevented him from going to several universities like Mm. it was just not allowed it prevented him from taking government positions above a certain level so so there were limitations that came with that stamp and i'm like but why would the soviet union implore that like based on your ethnicity you are prevented from having certain jobs and then i understood that 
because an ideological government, like a like you know, a totalitarian ideological government, wants you to buy into their ideology, they might view you because your ethnic background of a certain persuasion, they might view you as inherently ideologically disaligned with the purpose of that government. Right. And the most reductive way, the most reductive way to determine that is just your blood is the wrong kind of blood. Yeah. And because your blood is wrong, you're that you're ideologically not one of us. And that's the pandemic in a nutshell. The reason that they wanted to limit your travel or for you to be able to go to a restaurant is you weren't blood aligned with the government's ideology. That is that is communism in a nutshell, right? You're like, but they're giving you the choice. They're saying, hey, but if you give us your blood, if you give us domain over your over your over your uh, habitus, right? If you give us domain over your body, which is the ultimate surrender that you can possibly give to an authoritative source, if you let us into your blood. We don't even care if this thing works. What we care about is that your blood is the right kind of blood for you to ideologically. And by the way, if you think I'm crazy, look what happened to the people that protested in Canada against mandatory vaccines. They were called terrorists. Well, what is a terrorist? It's one who ideologically disaligns with the government. Like that's the definition of a terrorist. Like their ideology is that to as to destroy our institution. What institution is that? The, why, the one that we say is the correct institution. So when my grandfather said the stamp in my passport, you know, was the thing that defined me. I'm like, that's the stamp, that's the stamp on, your, on your ID card that defined you. You've been accused of being delusional as a budding entrepreneur. Um, have I been accused? Or are you saying well, I have been accused? So you have been accused of being delusional, just like most other entrepreneurs when they're trying something new. Uh, what does delusion mean to you in that context? I don't know if I was accused of being delusional. Uh, well, I, I say... I mean, yeah, I say I say accused. I mean, people yeah. in your group, right? When you try, when you try to puncture the veil, so to speak, in uh, in uh, in figuring out what you wanted to do, right? Well, I think based on my experience from observing other people, uh, there's so such a profundity, or sorry, such a preponderance of delusion amongst young people uh, that it would be not wrong to say that you know, if somebody told me like I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I would immediately question, you know, their sanity, like for sure. Um, and the reason for that is, well, let's put it this way. Like you have to have a disability to be an entrepreneur in the sense that you can't view obstacles the way that normal people view obstacles. And there is a, a, there is a level of, of, you know, incoherence to be able to not view such obvious things. Um, but, but having said that, like, you know, people do become entrepreneurs and they do become successful and, like I would say that that delusion should be should be matched with a very healthy amount of grit, and and you don't know you know right like I don't you don't know how you're going to react to highly stressful and volatile situations until really you're in them because all of us myself included I think we just think we're better than we are. Hmm. We think that you we're know? better than we are. Well, I mean, and maybe some people is the opposite. Maybe they're you know maybe they're maybe they're they're not maybe they're not quite as bad as they think they are but but I think you know if you're if you're trying and attempting something that's high risk high reward you have to have some belief that you're going to succeed and probably that belief has to exceed your skills at the current time that you're that you're taking that bet on yourself right let's go a, a little bit into your your history as a as a budding entrepreneur uh, because you went at it um if I can use old school in an old school manner so you were speaking to people you were doing door to door you were yeah. cold. You were cold selling, um, and you said something very, very interesting uh, for me because I haven't thought about it in many, many years. Because I was also a twenty-year-old male, and you were a twenty-year-old male knocking on doors, selling books, selling encyclopedias. And you said, "I had, hold on, let's see, I had seven seconds to defuse the bomb." Go. Well, that's it. Uh, you know, when somebody opens the door and it's a stranger and. You can pretty quickly deduce that stranger is there to sell you something, you know, and that's actually pretty funny because sometimes people open the door and they're like, are you selling something? I'm like, no, I'm walking around making friends. Like, what do you think I'm doing? You know, like, <laughs> obviously you're selling something. They get it. Um, and and there's a certain amount of, of personal boundary you cross because door to door is a very personal, like you're on somebody's property, like their kids might be playing in the backyard or front yard. True. You know, you're looking into their kitchen, whatever it is like. There's a there's a certain imposition into personal boundary that's not um, maybe felt by a lot of people today because we are and even back then like it was not as social as it was maybe in the 90s and 80s when all the kids were playing outside together. Yeah. yeah um, good point. So so there's you know now doing let's say building a business and and doing sales if through different channels you kind of feel that like there's a much more personal and visceral reaction to somebody showing up at your house 
and as a 20 year old male, there's, uh, I, I say this also with personal, uh, personal experience. There's, you also represent a threat, a physical threat Correct. to somebody. Yes, right. absolutely you do. Um, and so you do get, you know, so the people that they meet with you, there's a, there's an amount of skepticism that's pretty high. And you uh, like, to me, like, I, I mean, seven seconds is anecdotal, but like, cause there's that phrase of seven seconds to make an impression sure. or whatever, but like, yeah, sure. you don't have a lot of time to diffuse that bomb. It has to be a right amount of assertiveness, disagreeability, but also humor and charm. And that's, and that's, you know, that's not to, to butter myself up. That's more like you have to, at some point in life to optimize those variables together. If you want to be a socially cohesive and perhaps even a socially impelling human being, right? When you say disagreeability, uh, so I agree with you there, but that disagreeability, it, it's, uh, it's layered because you, you, you need to be thoughtful and you need to be, uh, you need to adapt to every situation just a little bit differently, which means you need to read people well. Is that missing today? Do you find? Now that Absolutely. You've been... uh, I mean, the evidence would say it is. I mean, like most partnerships today are formed online, which, in, mm. you know, which indicates two things like a, that most people are not finding romantic partners like relative to the past as, as they did like face to face, they're not doing that. And that B anybody that is socially adjusted to be good in social environments that are socially fluent have an unfair advantage because so there's so, so such a lower, you know, incidence rate of people being able to communicate face to face and do so very, you know, persuasively. Um, so the data, the big data would like very clearly indicate that there's a lot less social cohesiveness happening, right? As an, on an anecdotal level, let's say like just from my experience within my industry, obviously people say like, oh, cold calling doesn't work. It actually works way better than it ever has because so few people are masterful at it, right? Who picks up the phone and calls anybody anymore? Right. And what's funny is the people that do pick up the phone, they're just less equipped to, uh, to dissuade a salesman calling them. And I'm not saying that dissuade like, yeah, we're going to be pushy. No. Good salespeople are not pushy at all. Like we're we're very we're very compelling, um, and it's not about necessarily what we say. It's about letting them talk at the right time, and you know, mm. like the Socratic sort of thing. And, and you know, persuasion is not forcing somebody. That's a misconception. It's not forcing somebody to do something. You don't want to compel. You want to impel. You want to get them. You know, you're not selling as much as you're promulgating. You want them to buy into the message and act on their own behest from what you say. Like that's persuasion, right? Like you don't force a woman to go on a date with you. You you impel her to want to desire you. Like that's the ultimate level of salesmanship. Um, and that is a skill that you can learn in sales is how to get a prospect to emotionally, you know, because people make emotional decisions. Um, and 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 for sure, like in the 21 years that I've been in the game of building businesses and and selling products and services, like for sure, for sure, the preponderance of, of people that, even understand that this is a skill you can learn is significantly dropped and it might be a dead art. I don't know. Um, but those of us, those of us with it, man, it's uh, but ride, ride, man. It's awesome. <laughs> well, I think, I think part of that, when you say dead art, uh, I think listening and observing are uh, dying arts. So I, I, I'll parlay that into an example that you gave me when you were a university student and you were trying to make ends meet on your own. And uh, you remember about the parking fee? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, please relate that. I want to talk about that. Well, the parking in UBC in Vancouver went up from, I was a commerce student there at the time, and the parking went from $5 to $5.25, and I was like, crap, an extra 25 cents a day might push me over my limit. So I started parking on the highway at a $400 Toyota Corolla. I started parking on the highway and then rollerblading 30 minutes to campus. And uh, To save and, 25 cents. I mean, that's what, look, like I was 19 years old. Like, what the hell else do you do? Yeah. And, and somebody uh, saw and, that. Somebody saw that and came up to me and was like, hey, man, you know, and by the way, what's funny is I didn't mention this to you before, but that highway ended up putting signs that you couldn't park there anymore like two years later because then there was a row of cars that started forming with other students realizing <laughs> they don't have to pay for parking. Like it was far you enough started away that. that. Yeah, it was far enough away that you didn't have to pay for parking, but close enough that you can still make it to school at a reasonable time. Sure. Um, sure. So so that became like the thing. But yeah, somebody saw me rollerblading to class, approached me, was like, hey, man, what you doing? I was like, you know, rollerblading. Why? Oh, here's why. I was kind of like naive and just said, yeah, you know, just saves me on parking. I'm so proud of myself. And then they were like, you know, we have some summer job opportunities. Maybe you'd be interested. Um, and I didn't recognize that at myself at the time, you know, that sort of um, aspiration to do something creative to, you know, to avoid a toll or, or in another sense of putting it to capitalize on an opportunity which was, you know, it's a very simple thing, but it is what it is. And I got recruited into door-to-door -door selling because of that. Like, they're like, well, why don't you think about making some money? I'm like, that's maybe not a bad idea.
So fast forward, you were on this team. So that's Western. So British Columbia, for people who don't know geography in Canada, that's uh, Western coast. You're, you're, you're on the Pacific. You, you went to Ottawa for a couple of summers. It was Ottawa for one team. summer, Toronto for four summers, and then Calgary for one summer. So yeah. Okay. So for the most part, Central Canada, Calgary is still Western. And uh, you shared something with me that the, you you could get you could get home early from trying to sell door to door, but the team leader is the only guy who had the key to the door. So this is probably not so popular these days, you know. But it was kind of cultish, like it was it was an army type of environment, like cold showers in the morning. We had to, and it was funny. So we rent a room. There's three dudes in a room, three of us. We're all college kids, right? One guy's a bit older. He's kind of like coming back for his second or third summer. And a couple of rookies, three guys, two beds. So every day, you know, we're fighting about who gets the bet on their own, who sold the most, <laughs> you get the bet. Again, this would probably look toxic today, but it was a good experience. Yeah, sure. And sure. then we were renting this room from a couple that was in their 80s. And for whatever reason, whenever the shower was running, we could only use cold water. That was just something the company propagated. Like, you, you know, take, take cold showers in the morning. We're like, OK, we're going to do it. And it's hard as heck because it gets, you, you know, out of your comfort zone immediately. But for whatever reason, after the second guy or so showered, by the time the third guy was going in, there was soot that was collecting on the ceiling. It was black and gross. And then the third guy would then have to use a wet mop to mop it off the ceiling. Oh, my goodness. And so we would just, the moment the alarm rang, we would just spring and run as fast as we can because you don't want to be the guy wiping the soot off the ceiling, you know? And, and you know, that continued. Like, my my next few summers in Toronto, like, I remember Young and 16th, the Golden Flame restaurant, we would just be there every morning. And then after breakfast, you know, the owner was awesome. We had to do this dance outside about, like, how much we love our job, which was, again, super cultish and then the owner would come out and dance with us because and then some lawyers would join and they would dance with us because they thought we were insane but they're like whatever these kids are working hard we've been there yeah. and then you'd hit the and then you'd hit the doors and you know sometimes <laughs> you'd break down because you're out there for 14 hours a day and it's especially in ontario extremely hot in the summer um very humid you'd get sometimes nosebleeds because of the humidity changes in the day like i've gone through a couple summers where we just had a lot of smog in toronto um and if you want to go home good luck you don't have a key to get back in your house like usually the the senior team leader has the key. I became that guy after my third summer, right? Sure. Um, you have so the power. Like, if you can't move forward and you can't move backwards, man, you either grow or you die. Like you either quit or you grow. And thankfully, I didn't have a lot to go back to in the sense that like a regular summer job was not appealing to me as having to pay for school. I wanted to, you know, and the risk was there, but the reward was there. And thankfully, I didn't quit. Like thankfully, I, I stuck with it and, and learned the skills to, you know, the grit, the determination, the character, the persistence, the perseverance, and a little bit of people reading and persuasive selling as well um, to set me up for the next step, right? You said that you you wanted to eat so much shrimp or so much seafood that, was, well, that so, you made yeah, yourself I mean, allergic. Yeah, my first summer, I got about a $8,500 check and my university tuition back then, I'm going to date myself with 6000 bucks. Amazing, amazing. And Love so it. I still had 2500 bucks left over. And so it's I huge. basically... I went to Richmond Sushi. Anybody in Vancouver knows that legendary place, which is no longer around. But eleven ninety nine lunch, all you can eat. So my classes were basically later on, and uh, so I would go to Richmond Sushi every day and just get the buffet. That was my daily meal. That was my treat to myself for you know for doing something finally where I can have some freedom. And I ate so much shrimp that I actually developed a shrimp. I didn't even know you could do this. You can overeat a food that you develop. But I I still to this day. Uh, 21 years later, 20 years later, still have a, a, a shrimp allergy because of that. Well, I, I mean, it, it, it's obvious that you, you were built, you were built to focus and hone in on things. I mean, that's, that's part of your, that's part of your genetic makeup. It seems, uh, you were, you were the number one video game player for a while and in, in red alert. Yeah. Red alert. Yeah. And I'm, you were so I'm, obsessed. I'm obsessed. The word is obsessive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but that's not a sales thing. That's just a thing that some people have. Uh, you ch you chose to sell, uh, but you were you were number one in Canada. What did that mean? How did how did you become number one in Canada in this particular you're video game? You're talking about video games, yeah. So yeah. again, well, your greatest strength, I guess, is your greatest weakness. Like I'm also profound, probably very ADD. Like it just is what it is. And I guess you know one of the things that you want to, at least that I would say to young people is like you kind of want to understand yourself and direct yourself into a place where the things that are more natural to you are, are also part of your daily routine. Like if you are ADD like me, you, you know, you don't want to be an accountant, you know? And I say, when you, when I die and go to hell, that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to be an accountant. Right. Um, but you know, the, the thing that found me was video games and 
I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but once I realized how much of my time, I was playing Red Alert 2 and I became 17th ranked in the world in the online tournaments, number one in Canada. And, you know, the thing that, and I, this, I was missing months of school because of it, like literally months. Like I had early admission in grade 12 in TBC, so like my grades didn't matter after January. And I made sure that the school knew that my grades didn't matter, you know, <laughs> because uh, because I really just went down this rabbit hole of video games and, for about 18 months, like that game just consumed me and I was up at four in the morning playing tournaments and stuff like. And and at some point, you know, when I was like about 19 and, and change, I was like, this has to stop. Like, this is not a productive use of my time because all the outcomes I'm getting, this was before e-gaming and big money, like all the outcomes I'm getting are just reducing the quality of my life. My communication skills are suffering. My social interactions are suffering. My educational attainments, you know, achievements are suffering. Like, it's just not a good game to win. Like, there are games you can play in life, but this is just not a game that at the time brought me anything for winning, you know? Do you feel lonely? Today? Yeah. No. Did you ever? Uh, yeah, when I was playing video games 14, 16, 18 hours a day. Of course I did. What about as an entrepreneur? I'll tell you, I thought about this. Like, one of the things, too, so keep in mind, like, whatever the thing that you're letting kill you is also, like, attracting the people into your life that are on that same wavelength, on the same energy plane, let's say, right? So... My friends were also profound underachievers at that time. I felt lonely because like, I felt like I was meant for more than the heck the people I was hanging out with. That was profound loneliness, right? Hmm. Like profound loneliness. But the other thing that happened is as I started to grow, like as a young man and, you know, plant seeds of my future endeavors, like my friends started like sort of melting off of me, right? Because there was nothing for us to communicate about anymore. And my ethos changed so much. My existence probably just offended them. Like, I remember my friend was having a birthday party and it was like 6 p.m. And I showed up at like 9 p.m., you know, to his house somewhere in the in the in the burbs, you know, where like six guys are just sitting out having a beer and it's boring as heck. Like that's what it was. But I came three hours late because I was on campus recruiting my sales team. Like I was doing other things. And I think again, to them I just looked like a weird, brainwashed, you know, 20-year-old wearing a business jacket. Like, what are you doing, man? You know, yeah. aren't you gonna play some Xbox with us right now? Um, so as you grow, you know, the loneliness melted away. There was a, obviously a transitionary period where it's like you just don't have anybody to hang with because you haven't attracted the right people yet, but you've got rid of the people that weren't right for you. Yeah. Um, but today I don't feel lonely at all because, like, first of all, I have a wife I actually love and I'm profoundly attracted to. Like, that's a big thing because I didn't let myself settle in that regard. So I like spending time with her. I have four kids. I mean, you want to talk about lonely. I try to get away sometimes to have a little quiet at home because, you know, four young children, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I have enough people that are demanding my time within our international enterprise that I actually have to schedule my time to avoid people sometimes. And that's not a bad thing, right? You understand why I asked you? Yes. Okay. Um, because I, I ask this of myself all the time um, because uh, entrepreneurs are okay with being alone, I think. They're okay with being alone. Big time. Um, and I, so thank you for, uh, thank you for responding that way too, because lonely is something completely different. Um, and I think when you feel lonely as an entrepreneur, you're not, you're not finding yourself alone enough. Mm. I get that. I think also, and you tell me uh, if I'm off, I think, people are attracted like team members clients your sphere gets attracted to you when you feel okay you 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 show them that you feel okay going at something on your own because it sets an example and in essence that brings people with you i think people like that you know remember that show two and a half men no it wasn't two and a half yeah. men it was big bang theory big bang theory yes yes and there was an interesting monologue by Leonard, one of the characters that sticks with me. Me and my wife used to watch the show. He says, when you're alone is when you become interesting. Love that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's great. It's beautiful. And, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, like I was thinking about this driving to work like literally today. Like literally I was like, should I make this my Facebook status? Because I like sharing little nuggets of ideas that come to my brain. It's like, you know, when I was door to door selling, I was alone 14, 15 hours a day, just knocking on doors, like just me alone, right? Developing that skill. I've worked with a lot of, like, I've worked with Zach Wilde and Ozzy Osbourne, Alice Cooper, and I've asked them these questions. It's like, Rob Trujillo for Metallica, great guy. You know, like, when I went to see him a couple times in California last month, like, he's just alone in a studio playing the bass for, like, 12, 13 hours a day. Literally, like, I went in the morning, I had to come back in the evening to see him again. He's just sitting there alone, tap, playing on his bass, just completely alone, right? 
And when you think about one of the most interesting human beings on, on earth, it would be a guy that plays in freaking Metallica. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excuse me. I would agree. I would agree to that. Um, but I guess when you're when you're also when you're also alone, you're you're honing it. You're um, not you're honing. You're you're bringing your curiosities to a point where you can explore them, right? And you can that's create. A brilliant, that's brilliant. Yeah. You you are you are. That's right. You're pursuing curiosity, and that's the thing about video games. Like that curiosity let down a, a, a dark a dark ending. Like it's not it's not culminating into what I, I I want for my life. But you know, and I was thinking again. Like when I started this company. Uh, I would just sit in my office by myself. Like I would get to the office seven in the morning. There's nobody else in the company at the time. I would pick up the phone, start cold calling in the morning. And I continue to do it until six, 7 PM when nobody was picking up the phone anymore. And it was years of that, right? Like years of that sitting alone and honing my art and, and, and sort of iterating out my curiosity in that field. And yeah, I mean, it was, it was just a lot of alone time, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was lonely because I was pursuing something that was meaningful to me. Do you find yourself creative? Man, I have such a crazy, I have a very hard time with that question. Why? Um, the first person, so, so I'll say this. So like, you know, like one, I think the reason you reached out to me is you guys saw my work and my company's work with George Peterson, right? Yeah, you're super. That's probably yeah, the, yeah. where the attention came from. And I, I, I'm going to say this, but I need to qualify it first. Like, I'm not like best friends with George Peterson. Like, I, I know him. I've had three or four conversations with him for maybe 20, 30 minutes, mm-hmm. you know, He's very busy. He's operating at a level I've never seen any other human being personally operate before. Obviously, there's a intelligence there that's so profound that like every time he opens his mouth, it's like you just want to listen and learn. So I'm not going to paint this like I'm best friends with him. But the couple of times that I've had a conversation with him face to face, like let's say three or four times, um, he's always said something that could, like just profoundly shifted my opinion of myself. And I don't know how intentional it was, but one of, he was really the first person that looked me in the eye and said, man, you are so creative. Hmm. Like nobody in my life had either mentioned that to me before, or perhaps I didn't listen. And because of the profound respect I have for, for Dr. Peterson, I maybe listened for the first time. He said, you are so creative, you know, like, and, 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 and so the last time I saw him was last week in DC at a show and we're, you know, backstage just chatting. And I was like, you know, he was explaining why he loves this icon jacket that I made for him, the one that's like now being really associated with his brand. Like I designed that jacket, I sat on my computer and I told him, I said, so Jordan, you know, uh, you just described to me everything about this jacket that you love. And I didn't even know that when I made it. My, my idea was, you know, you told me you wanted something to represent sort of orthodox iconography. And so I, I researched it, I studied it, you know, as much as I, as deep as I could go during work and after work and I was reading about all these symbols and I'm like, okay, these are the things I want on this jacket. And then I put a jacket together with those images and you're telling me all these things I don't know. And then Jordan Peterson said, well, you know, Dimitri, uh, a lot of artists don't understand the art they create. That's normal. Okay. And that sent me off into like a basically an existential crisis. I was like, and I'll tell you why. Hmm. Basically. Yeah. Because as like an entrepreneur, well, first of all, let's go start sales. I'm like, I have a goal. I want to hit that goal. And here's the steps I need to take. And if I'm disciplined, I'll hit that goal. It's like bodybuilding. Like, here's how much muscle I want to put on. You have somebody that's good that can explain how to do that. And then you work, you know, backwards on deconstructing it. And then you follow that, that plan. Yeah. And that's like sales. Like, I have a goal. Let's hit it. And in entrepreneurship, it's like, I have to understand every aspect of my company, whether it's my, you know, cash flow statement or, or end of year tax filing or my, you know, per, per, per pack per transaction basket size or how many you know the velocity of transactions that we conduct in a month per salesperson like everything is is very structured and understood or at least you're always trying to bring things into order yeah i mean that's really how you grow businesses you bring things into order you understand what your key driving variables are and you bring them into order so everything for me was very goal orientated even designing jordan peterson's wardrobe it's like i have a a final outcome that i'm trying to pursue and here's how i'm going to get to that outcome and then here he goes to me, he goes, you know, you don't need to understand your own art. And it completely removed the boundaries, right? And then I understood, I understood two things. Number one, my own vanity, because it's like everything I pursue has such a, um, everything I pursue is such an objective outcome that I'm looking at, like, like a goal-oriented outcome that brings me something back. But then that second thing that it helped me really discover is that my creativity has been completely limited by the fact, if let's say that creativity at all exists, it's been completely limited, limited by the fact that I'm so results-orientated that if you drop me in a force with an axe, I'll just start chopping wood right away. Mm-hmm. 
mean, you know, that's the conscientious aspect. But most artists that I've met, like, it made sense to me finally. They're not very conscientious. They don't really care about the outcome. They're just trying to express what they want to express and put it out there. Whatever happens, happens, right? Yeah, they're responding to the push that they feel. Right? Yeah, that's exactly it. And for me, that push that I feel, I'm like, how do I, how do I capitalize this push? Like, how do I monetize this? Right? And and does it even fit within the framework of what I'm doing right now, in in the pursuit of the goals of the company? But him telling me that kind of made me realize, I'm like, crap, man. The reason Jordan Peterson suits became so popular is not because Jordan Peterson's wearing them, because he's got lots of gray, black, and blue suits that aren't that popular. Let's say, like in the scheme of things, popular being that they draw attention, or let's say viral, be a better word. They're viral because I had no such commercial restriction in designing his wardrobe because I was told right up front by his daughter, right up front, she was like, you will never tell anybody that you're making his suits and nobody will ever know. And that's and that's the social contract we're entering this with. And I said, that's fine. And so when I designed the suits, commercial commercial viability was never a consideration. I just wanted him to like it. I just wanted it to be meaningful to him. And so maybe that didn't extend the full breadth of the creativity I might possess. I don't know, because there was still a restriction that he has to find it meaningful. But taking the commercialization away, let me explore my own creativity, because I've never made suits like that before, because our clients are lawyers and bankers, and they wear gray and blue suits. Nobody wears two-color suits or printed iconography suits or anything like that, right? Nobody. Nobody. So, so, so when people are like, oh, that's what your company does. I'm like, no, that's what I did for Jordan Peterson. That's not what my company does because I've never done it before. But I was allowed to explore the breadth of my own creativity. And he called me creative. And I was like, holy crap, maybe. And nobody's ever said that to me in my life. Yeah. And so I, I, I get all of it. I get all of it. Um, there's nothing there that I would possibly dispute, except I, I, see, I see your creativity through the lens of a fellow entrepreneur. Like you, you saw, and now knowing your story, you saw an opportunity and you met that opportunity with a push that you're trying to answer. And that opportunity was a hole through the veil. And that veil was in, I mean, in, in this case, that, that veil was the outer boundaries of the industry that you're in. So how, how do you make your slice out of this industry, if the the boundaries are this, well, maybe I can extend the boundaries, maybe I can change the boundaries, or maybe I can just poke through it and find my slice. I mean, the entrepreneurs that I like to I like to speak to, I already went through that discovery process. Like, we're not even talking about success here. We're talking about just seeing how to puncture through. Um, and you were actually brutally honest with me, which is what I also appreciate because we were talking about this when you were finding the opportunity. Uh, and you said you wanted to compete against unsophisticated competitors mm-hmm. in a sphere that wasn't regulated. I mean, you were you, you were pretty forthright. What what made what made you a little bit different in the industry at the beginning? Well, firstly, uh, the reason I wanted to com- compete against unsophisticated competition was because I went to a pretty good business school. A lot of my friends ended up, you know, at PwC or went to Goldman Sachs or like had. My other friends have like degrees in honors physics. I was just very, um, I, I, I was like ill confident, you know, like insecure because my friends were just so smart. My, my best friend at the time had skipped two grades of high school. My other really close friend had skipped one grade of high school. Both their parents on both sides had PhDs, <laughs> you know, and I'm coming in from like social housing as an immigrant. My parents were working class. And, um, and so I think there was a, a profound insecurity that made me ask what, what my, my best friend at the time who had a summer internship at GS. And he was, I was like, how do I compete against guys like you? Because like, I just I just feel like I, like I love that you guys are my friends, but I, honestly, I feel a little bit out of my league. And he was like, well, you can pursue this. You can go into some sales role, you know, in a big bank and you'll probably do fine competing against guys like that. Or you can find a business that you can compete against artisans, he said, you know, uns- unsophisticated artisans. Whereas you're in it for the money, they're in it for the art. And I was, because the, like, that's kind of in a way what Jordan Peterson said, like, you know, artists don't know the outcome of, or they don't understand their own art. Sure. He's like, you can compete against those people. And just, I'm like, yeah, like I'm, I'm fairly quantitative in my thinking. Um, you know, I'm, I'm good with numbers. I understand that. And I know by that point I can sell. So just, it was just very cogent that I would go into an industry where I could sell something that I understand. Um, and, and how was I going to compete against those guys? Well, I was willing to, and this is the answer right here. I knew that I was willing to do things they weren't willing to do. Like I wasn't just going to open a store and sit around because it's not in my character to open a store and sit around. I'm going to pick up the phone and cold call and I'm going to get in front of people they can't. And 
my my thing was like, and this might sound a little bit, um, in, you know, insidious. It wasn't meant like that. It was just a, a personal motivational thing. I was like, I'm going to put these other tailors out of business. Like when I show up in your town, watch out. Like when I show up, you know, you know so I was like, I'm going to, I was in Calgary when I started the company. I'm like, I am going to, you know, I would walk by some, some, some store and I'm not going to say any names. I was like, man, I'm going to take food out of your mouth today. That's literally like as a, as a, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, I'm going to take your clients. That's it, man. Like I just showed up to win. And my number one thing I would tell myself as a, as a, um, affirmation was I would hate to compete against myself. Hmm. Like I'm going to be the guy that competitors hate. Cause, and, and it happened. Like I started taking some pretty awesome clients, you know, guys, that are top CEOs and stuff. And once or twice during the first five or six years, some local tailor called me. He's like, well, you know, you don't even know what you're not even a tailor. You're just selling guys, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and it's pretty funny because it's so petty that somebody would make that call. And and when it happened, the first time I just said, look, man, you can hate me all you want. In 20 years, I'm still going to be here taking your clients. So maybe maybe there was just like a very profound competitive streak that I learned about myself. And you have to be very competitive as an entrepreneur. Like you need a sure. bad guy to defeat. You just do. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Robert Herjavec talks about that in his book. Kevin O'Leary talks about that in his books. Like you see entrepreneurs have a very like even you saw Steve Jobs talk about it. Like entrepreneurs have a competitive streak. Of course. Right? And, uh, and so, and so what was driving that was, was probably a little bit of just wanting to win a little bit of insecurity and an understanding that I'm willing to get my hands dirty. You know, a lot of my business came from one of my best clients ever. Uh, I would just walk up to him on the street. I was like, I really like your suit and I'm going to guess you're a lawyer. And he's like, I am. How did you know? I said, you just, you have the aura, man. That's what I do for a living. I sell suits and I come to your office and I got his card and he became a huge client for me and I sold everyone in his law firm and. No, that's cold probably, call. That probably that was a, that was yeah, a cold yeah. call. Yeah. Street, appro street approaching was a big part of my business. You know, again, you want to find a romantic story in a company that designed suits for Ozzy Osbourne. There's no romance here. It was just freaking doing things that others weren't. Well, I was riding elevator. I've been kicked out of every every office tower in Canada, especially when I had rookies and I was training them. And we would just yeah. ride elevators and walk into offices to introduce ourselves until security kicked us out. Yeah, this is. I, I I think I've said this before too on the podcast. It, it's too bad that we celebrate the final success, like that that needle point is what we like to celebrate. But and you know, and, and we all we always hear about the overtalk. It's the journey. It's the journey. But I mean, it really is. The final point is not. It's not to be celebrated. What's to be celebrated is the resilience, right? It doesn't matter what you do in life. It's the resilience and the hard work and the grind. Now, the purpose behind it. And so, so I, I'm, I'm with you. Now, the purpose behind it, you said, I, I was in it to win. I was in it to, to beat the bad guys. Has that changed for you? That's a really good question. I think as I've gone older, A, my energy changed. Hmm. Like I tell guys all the time, what I did in my 20s and 30s, I'm 41 now. I would never be able to do that today. Like it, if I had to sell against 29-year-old, 28-year-old Dimitri, I would lose. Yeah. <laughs> like that guy had a freaking chip on his shoulder, man. Hmm. You know? And I think a big part of 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 um, of growing up and and it probably being just placated by a little bit of that success, if you want to call it that, like it just it just it does you know the hunger. I can see that in athletes, right? Like a forty one year old boxer is not the same as a twenty nine year old boxer. Like it's just sure. a different level of hunger that exists. It's not just yep. physical. There's a different level of hunger. There's a ferocity because, that's there. Yeah, ferocity. That's it. Like you're you're just placated by a little bit of your own success. So, and I'm not trying to say that I'm ill motivated. I'm not. I think the other aspect of it is I just take greater pleasure now in the success of others within our company. And so as I started to recruit and hire and develop people, I took a lot of pride in seeing the people that I was developing actually in a lot of cases starting to outperform me. I love it. I love that. You know, and I was like, wow, this feels very good because at some point legacy starts to deeply matter. And that's probably my greatest driving pr uh, purpose today is I don't want to just be a company that made suits for Jordan Peterson and Alice Cooper. Like, I don't want that to be on my gravestone. You know, I, I think, I think as you grow and you have an opportunity to change lives, you want to change lives. I want to see people in our organization grow, develop, build successful, brilliant careers. I have guys in my company now that have, you know, have wives and kids that they've built their entire careers on in our company. That's very profoundly meaningful, deeply meaningful to me. Yeah. Um, I, I want mean, others. You're, you're, you're building a tree. So you're, if we're going to use legacy, your word, your legacy is the tree that you built, the tree that you yeah. planted, right? Many, many years ago. And those two, so your Jordan Peterson, your Alice Coopers, they're like little limbs on a branch of that tree. I, I'm not to diminish it, but I mean, that's what it is, right? When you're building the story, again, that's the pinprick that people see, but it's the, 
this is this is what's beautiful about the human story is that we are a plant if we care about what we are and who we are and where we're going we are that tree that tree you know that tree is big but you know that that tree keeps growing every year you can't see it but it's growing and it's growing underground as much as it is above ground and it's creating those connections and it's nurturing others and it's being nurtured and, and nourished by others. You don't see it, but it's happening. Mm. Well, I have to think too, like, you know, again, this is going to be very pragmatic, but like I can only measure my leadership by, I won't see the culmination of my leadership. Like I'll be long dead. And then either the company dies with me or it continues for many generations and becomes something that people talk about like a, like a Brioni, which is a great brand. You know, the, the founders aren't around, but man, everybody knows that brand. That's the one, you know? Um, and, and this exists in different industries, of course. So I, I, I'll say something wild. Uh, who cares about your company? Like, who cares? Yeah. So, uh, and I say that your company, I mean, I, who cares about I, yeah, my yeah. company, whether, whether yeah. my company lasts or not after I die? Because uh, yeah. I, I, I think about these things, right? So I ask myself these questions, not yes, that I've convinced yes, yes, myself. Yes. Uh, it's because you, you, I want to parlay it into something else that you told me. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you're quoting somebody else or this is your idea, but let's run with it. You said, when you kill desperation, you kill the true essence of creativity. So, I mean, a company is not a reflection of desperation or uh, 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 of answering a desperate call. Maybe it's the end result of that process, but... Again, let's go back to when you kill desperation, you kill the true essence of creativity. What does that mean? Well, okay, but this actually does extrapolate very, very, uh, let's say, there, there's a strong tangent to a maturing company in that, and I'll come, come to that in a second. Desperation is the things you're willing to do for success. So, for example, um, let's talk about, let, I, I don't want to use examples that are like maybe too risky for the podcast, but one good example would be like salespeople in the commission. I know for a fact that if I pay salespeople a base salary forever, uh, they're never going to reach their true potential because there's not enough desperation for them to do uncomfortable thing to get that big sale, that last sale, mm. that extra call, that extra little thing, right? And I've seen this because I've had salespeople on, on a large base salary and, and I've had people on full commission and I've had people on mixed plans over the years. And the worst outcome I ever got was people on salary because they showed up and they went through the motions, but they didn't do the uncomfortable things. They, maybe they still need to confront a shitty client, you know? Because that client's losing the company money. And and sometimes you have to fire a client. But if you're on a base salary and there's no disincentive for you to keep a shitty client, then you're just going to keep a client that undermines the purpose of the organization. And the organization never reaches its potential, as an example, right? Mm -hmm. But and that's and that's and, and I, the way we talked about it before with desperation, it's like, you know, we have a well, I'll say the word we have a porn pandemic, let's say, happening in the youth amongst the youth today. At least the data says that we that we do. But then we also have at the same time, like at a time where it's easier to meet strangers than ever before because of online dating, you have less sex happening amongst the youth than ever before, too. And that's and that's been, you know, backed by by a lot of different data. And it's like, why? And one answer might be that guys are just not really that desperate anymore. And so they take less social risks in order to obtain, you know, the woman that they aspire to obtain because they just have such easy access to visual stimulation that didn't happen before. That might be, you know, yeah. one explanation for that. But as, a, as, as you kind of draw that tangent to a company, as a company grows, you say, well, how does a company then actualize, you know, desperation? Because you you're not a successful company and necessarily desperate, right? And the way you do it is with just a little bit of chaos. Like the best results I find in a company happen, at least for me, and I've heard other entrepreneurs say it too, is the best results don't happen when everything is perfectly ordered. And they certainly don't happen with pure chaos. They happen right at the edge of chaos. Like just ordered enough that things are working, but just chaotic enough that people are able to express themselves freely and go a little bit outside the system to achieve their goals. Well, and that's I where see artists live. Yes, artists live yes, yes. on the edge of chaos. Yes. yes. <laughs> that's been my and that's been my personal experience, right? And that's a government thing too. Like I see, you know, do I want to live in a system like China with a social credit store score that counts how many beans I ate that month? Uh, you know, or do I like that in the West, you know, we have a certain amount of respect for our institutions that things work, but just enough chaos for us to still be able to disrupt? Again, like, how does that desperation, like, a, desperation leads to a lot of creativity, man, and a lot of risk taking is not a bad thing. I mean, obviously, you don't want it to be so desperate that people are trying to survive. Uh, but sometimes a little bit of that's okay. Like a lot of the most successful people I know yeah. certainly come from pretty disruptive backgrounds. Yeah.
Yeah, I, I like that. A little bit of that, because at the beginning, you we were talking about uh, uh, food rationing at 4 a.m., uh, lining up for your bread. So, I mean, in a totalitarian state, um, and I'm talking also uh, figuratively speaking, um, food, figuratively speaking, is the tool, right? So if you keep stomachs, if you keep stomachs empty, you keep thoughts uh, caged. Um, but a little bit of desperation, a little bit of lack of food is good because there's clarity that comes from that too, right? Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about seduction. Mm. And uh, you started off by telling me last time, you said seduction is a predictable process. What does that mean? Well, I mean, if you watch human nature, you know, there's a reason why AI can predict human nature in like some pretty profound ways. Like if you've been in the, for example, I would imagine that like psychologists face the same situation repeatedly because people, you know, that get themselves to a certain point make enough decisions iterated out over enough time that you start to determine there's patterns to human behavior, right? Um, I see that from a social engineering perspective, let's say as a salesman, uh, I, I know that, you know, when I make a certain approach towards making a sale, I'm going to have a limited number of objections that are going to repeat themselves over and over. And that's the puzzle I have to unlock. And that infers that people have predictable patterns. Sure. It's like, it's quantum, right? It's not like every time this happens, but I know that like, a certain percent of the time, a certain outcome is going to occur, and I need and I need to know how to, how to confront that outcome, right? And so, sales is seduction. Business is seduction. Like for example, the reason that Amazon may be the biggest company in the world today, and the most people buy from it, is they've made themselves a pretty attractive partner. Um, you know, to uh, what's the right word here? Uh, they've made themselves a pretty attractive partner. Let's say to to make love with when it comes to spending your money. You know. Like sure. without, without leaving your desk, without leaving your phone. Right. Well, that's it. Like, it's like, yeah. we wouldn't want to buy from a company that's fast, that's cheap, that's convenient, that has full transparency on people's readings of the products. You can go the list. Like Amazon is just a really attractive partner to meet with, let's say. And that's why people choose that partner uh, to conduct that transaction with economic transaction. Right. You, you live in Europe. So you live in Estonia. Um, I, I know when I go to Europe, uh, specifically Western and Southern Europe is where I go when I go. Uh, I, I, live, I live through the interaction with people because there's a different sense. There's a different environment in those interactions. And I'm talking about specifically about marketplaces. So uh, Amazon is a marketplace. So when I go to a food market anywhere in a village in Italy or in Spain, I, it is energetic because you see success and failure and you feel it immediately. You know what works when you try and negotiate. You know what doesn't work. You see products, you see people, you read people and you're being read. That's the wonderful thing about it. You're being read all the time. And it makes, it makes me feel more astute to the nuances of living as a human being. Uh. Like it sharpens me. Knowing that I'm being watched Knowing that I'm being assessed, it's wonderful. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> is, I, know there, I, listen, there, I thought there was I, a I question love, there, but there listen, wasn't. I, I love I love it too, but most people hate that, right? Like that's why like people that are highly neurotic tend to sort of uh, be more complicit towards totalitarianism because it takes the onus off of them to be responsible for wherever the fruits of their tree grows, right? Like for me, I love the mar I love the market judging. We talked about it last time. It's one of the reasons I wanted to physical products is I wanted to compete against something that was tangible. People could compare against other great brands and see like I really wanted to be proud of the product we developed, which is, in my opinion, the greatest product ever made in our industry, period. End of sentence, right? So there is a, there is a certain uh, you know, profundity for guys like you and me, let's say that entrepreneurs, like we like the fact that the market will judge us, right? Like, we like that because we want to aspire for truth as the greatest principle. It's something I know about myself, and I think you realize about yourself as an entrepreneur. Like, truth as the highest form of principle is beautiful. Like, the reason people buy from me is because I make myself the most attractive partner to buy from. And if somebody wants to question my ethics or morals in supplying that product or service, well, then I implore them to create a better argument and take the money away from me. People vote with their money in a, in a capitalist economy, right? So... 
and and it's okay to even mimic status if you can deliver on this on on the product that you're that you're offering right like and if i and i know that i do and how do i know because people keep coming back and paying me again and again like that's not nothing you know um and so what and as we talk about like seduction it's like yeah it's the same thing and the reason i brought it into the conversation last time is i think it's more sort of visceral to us as humans to understand seduction it's like if you are a very attractive partner to others, and that's not just physical attractiveness, though that is part of the equation, but like if you're an attractive partner to others, well, you're going to be much better at seduction. And if you want to judge your morality, you know, you don't judge your morality as a fat, ugly dude that can't get a chick because then it's like, well, you're just powerless. Morality to me is being powerful and then showing how you control that power. Like I have the ability to sell a lot of suits right now because our company does sell a lot of suits right now. And you know what? Um, we choose nonetheless to operate in a way that continues to deliver the highest, what we believe is the highest quality of product to our clients. Now, other of course clients can judge that based on the merits of what they receive, but, but, but I can make that choice. I can make a choice of how to spend my money. I'm not, I'm not protesting against something I, I don't understand. I'm not, I'm not propagating against something I haven't done, which to me is like, you know, that moral sanctum sanct what is it that sanctimonious insanity that's happening right now people are like oh bring this down bring that down it's like go build something mm. and then and then and then use the power you wield in a positive way rather than taking away the away from the institutions you haven't built and don't understand and so coming back to the like more primal seduction it's like you know i think i give a lot of credit to me 20 years ago for having the balls to say hey if i want to find a, a wife that i'm really into i better get pretty good with girls because otherwise I'm going to be the otherwise my marriage might just result as an adjustment of the market surplus that I don't want to be participating in. I don't want to be a market surplus. Let's, let's that's, that a way. Good, that's good rationality. You know? uh, it, um, uh, yeah. You see, you see, um, you see money as points. Yes. Go. It's just a feedback mechanism, man. Like, like, look, I'm not I'm not in government where I'm signing duplicitous contracts with kickbacks and, you know, obfuscating the the goal that I'm actually pursuing. Uh, you know, that's that's not what I'm doing. I'm a, I'm a capitalist in a capitalist economy. I don't choose. I don't choose um, who I take money from. People choose me. Hmm. You know, people choose me. That's really important. So. So, yeah, money, money in a in a true transparent capitalism. Like and I'm a free market kind of guy, you know. That's just feedback on how I'm doing relative to the rest of the market. That's all that is. And that's just points. That's just points telling me, like, am I doing okay in life? And I know a lot of people would deeply disagree with that because, in my opinion, they have a profound insecurity. Or they're just useless. And I'm not useless. And that's it. I mean, you're, you're taking power away from money by, uh, by treating it as points. I mean, you're, you're, you are concentrating on the self rather than on uh, the financial gain from your activities. I think I mean, that's, that's everything in life. It. That's everything in life. You know, I, I had this theory when I was even younger, I would say that like, you know, for example, like in my, when I was 18, 19 years old playing video games, zero women wanted to date Dimitri. Like not one woman was interested in any of what I was offering. You know what I mean? And that was very upsetting to me because I knew guys that had a lot of options that I didn't have, you know, and, and there was, and it was an easy way to become resentful. Right. Sure. Uh, but then I thought, you know, maybe, and then this took me a couple of years to really realize I wasn't like a profound, epiphany it was like it just took me years to become a little bit more wise it's like you know maybe women are just the mechanism that god's sending me to tell me how i'm doing in life you know maybe they're <laughs> tell, maybe, maybe they're just saying something about me. maybe the way that women react to me is and not saying a lot about them maybe it's saying a lot more about me yeah yeah you know and, and maybe i should make myself a more attractive option however that you know however that looks like um and and that's sort of owning that personal responsibility like Man, if we had, if we had more personal responsibility being taught instead of you know weaponizing victimhood as some kind of a some kind of a an award to be won, if we if we if we promoted personal responsibility as that pinnacle of success, then I think we'd have a lot more success to go around. I, I mean, that's that's spoken like a a, a parent of a child. I mean, uh, I mean, you would want your child to feel and be accountable to their actions, their person their futures i mean that's any respectable parent would want that so why wouldn't you ask that of yourself i guess is the question that you're asking or the point that you're making i think well as jordan pearson would say people are better at giving medicine to their dogs than to themselves ah uh, <laughs> 
I like. I haven't heard him say that. That's funny. Uh, rule rule number two, right? Oh, is it? Uh, okay. the, rule number two in twelve rules five. Yeah. I actually haven't read the book. That's interesting. Uh, sorry. La- last question, Dimitri. I, I know I keep saying it, but um, I want to know from you what uh, what is greatness to you. So, so again, this is a, I've thought about it. I, I think about leadership. Like, so there could be greatness as like personal, as like personal accomplishment. That's great too, obviously. Like that's a, that's not nothing to aspire towards, but I think in terms of leadership, um, and for me, it took me probably 20 years to really define what leadership means for me, what it means, because somebody asked me once in an interview or somebody I knew asked an interview, what is leadership? And it's like, how do you pinpoint that? Right. And today I think of leadership as and it's very specific. These words are very intentional. Leadership is how many people you help to help themselves. Hmm. So leadership is not helping people because that's charity. For example, you know, charity is not like it's helping people, but, but it's not really rescuing them from their own perils. So to me, leadership is how many people you help to help themselves. So if I think about greatness, you know, uh, or greatness as, as, as I can, I combine it to, I conflate it to leadership, let's say. I think greatness is uh, how many people you help to help themselves. Well, and, um, and, you know? Yep. I, sorry, my point is uh, the point that I want to make. I mean, you're obviously doing that with your business. Uh, I'm and trying. You're, well, your business is a your business is a tool for that. I mean, I, that's that's a, a noble thing in society, right? And it's, uh, I, I think when the world when the world is bereft of entrepreneurs, uh, it will become and it can become a very bleak place. Yep. As you so in the conversation. Yeah, I that's uh, I'm I'm a, I, I, yeah I feel that way too. Dimitri, thank you for all your time here. Appreciate the chat. Very cool. Thank you. I I, I enjoyed it. <laughs>